Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar called Let's Talk, um, Rehousing Strategy, Service Delivery, and System Reform. My name is Natalie Matthews, and I am just going to spend a very brief moment going over some logistics for us today before we hear from the wonderful speakers that we have. So first and foremost, a little bit of housekeeping, um, a recording of today's webinar along with a copy of the slides and a copy of any of the questions that you all send to us during the webinar. All of that will be posted to the HUD Exchange within two to three business days. All of that information is going to be posted to the link that is on your screen right now. Um, so just be on the lookout for that. And if you're having audio issues during our time together today, I do ask you to um, switch from your computer audio to the 1-800 number that's up on the screen. That 1-800 number tends to be a little bit clearer in terms of audio um, if you're having any issues during our time together. Other things to mention is that uh, attendees are all going to remain muted for the duration of our time together today, but you will still have opportunities to connect with us through the chat functionality. So if you're in WebEx with us right now, you should see a link um, to several different icons on the bottom of your screen. And what those icons are, um, one of them will be your chat message. Um, so if you click on the chat message, that'll open up the chat box for you, and that's going to let you send messages of, again, questions, comments, feedback, whatever you'd like to share, please go ahead and send that in through the chat functionality. We'll keep an eye on those throughout, and we'll do our very best um, to respond to those during our time together. And with that, I am going to um, oh, sorry, before I forget, when you are sending those messages, please, please, please um, send them to all participants. Um, it should default to all participants, but again, please make sure to send them there because it makes sure that the attendees as well as our great panelists and presenters all get to see those messages too. And now I'm going to pause and turn things over to Sarah Wells um, from HUD's Office of Special Needs Assistance Program. Hello, can everybody hear me? Um, thank yes, you guys yes. for all being here this afternoon. Um, we are here to talk about rehousing and um, service delivery, a number of things, um, but mostly our conversation is gonna be about um, leveraging uh, persons with lived experience and how we can uh, incorporate that into things that we do on a regular basis. Um, but before we get started with that, um, I would like to just have a moment of silence, um, just to acknowledge everything that is going on in the world right now. Um, and so just whatever may be troubling you at this moment, um, I hope that you can find some peace in, in this time. and. We could just all observe a very brief moment of silence. That would be great. Um, so, like I said before, um, our conversation is going to be based on um, rehousing strategy, service delivery, and we have a few um, speakers with us today. Um, our first speaker, hopefully, has been able to connect um, to the audio. It's Sean, are you there? Can everyone hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if maybe is Eric there? Maybe we can start with Eric. Uh, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep, I'm great. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, so I, I'm a homeless advocate here in Washington, D.C. 
Uh, and I, I guess, I, well, I've been advocating for about 14 years for DC's homelessness, 2006. And I have some stuff written down here. I, I don't see myself showing on video, but, but anyway. <laughs> um, it's, uh, so I, I'm a working homeless person. Uh, and I, I do event rentals, tents, tables, chairs, porta parties, those kinds of things, for like block parties, types of events. Uh, so right now, we aren't, we aren't doing many events because of COVID-19. However, my company was contacted to provide porta parties for the homeless here in Washington, D.C., the ones living in tent cities. Uh, and it's one of those deals where once you start giving something, you can't take it away. Uh, and, and so the public has really... Be, uh, Come to light the fact that the homeless have these porta potties, and they're saying they're not using the alleys and that kind of thing. And I had a friend in uh, Philadelphia told me that they had a big issue with uh, a Hep C outbreak, hepatitis C, because of people using the alleys. And so it's a public health issue, but that uh, people want continued how, how, housing. People, I mean, housed people actually want these things to stay, uh, but that that that's all part of my my uh, lead into something else. Uh, which is that uh, as a working homeless person, I was contacted on November 20th of last year and and told that my name came up, but it's been seven months almost, and, and I still don't have the voucher in my hand. And in the meantime, I ended up in quarantine for two weeks from April 30th to May 14th. So, so that says a lot to the need to, to speed up that the housing process, you know, I get how I get quarantined more than five months after uh, I get called by housing. And, and uh, another thing is that DC government is spending approximately $180 per night to put somebody in quarantine. And yet what they pay to house somebody is about $2,600 a month, which is just, just under $90 per night. You know, and so you can save a lot of money by expediting the housing process, and you can spend half as much per night uh, per person if you can expedite the uh, housing process. But I should also say that D.C., uh, Permanent Supportive Housing, they've modified the program to a certain extent to where you don't have to have any uh, severe mental illness or, or health issues. Uh, just your length of homelessness moved you to the top of the list now, uh, but but then that that's got its uh, its problems too because I was told that you can't make over twenty five thousand dollars a year uh, if you're going to be in supportive housing, but uh, on, in D.C. the minimum wage is fifteen dollars an hour. So if you were to qualify that minimum wage, you make thirty thousand dollars a year, which means that you don't qualify for the housing program, but at the same time, uh, you, ha you have to make like $6,000 a month for DC rents. DC rents run around 2500 $2, a month, so uh, if you don't make $90,000 a year, it's hard to, to swing DC rents. And so why would the cap be at 25000 to qualify for this housing program, which has been modified to, to help people who are not mentally or physically disabled. Uh, and, and so that they're not really bringing everything together. DC has a, uh, a really good record for taking care of the homeless while homeless, but they do a, a really bad job of ending homelessness. And, you know, they, and they'll pay a rent for you that is the, the equivalent of you earning $90,000 a year or more, but they won't let you make more than $25,000 a year if you're part of that program, uh, and, and, and let me see what else I have written down here that I that I didn't uh, mention already. Uh, so I, I think I think that's that's pretty much uh, uh, everything that I have here. You know, just, hey, just to sum it up. Eric, this is Lisa. Thank you so much for that. Would you, uh, for the interest of the homeless assistance providers and other advocates that are on the call, could you talk more about your work? in helping to get porta potties and resources for uh, hygiene for people. Um, that might be uh, experience that people are really interested in hearing about to kind of figure out how they can replicate something in their community. Okay, so, so that, well, well, that's actually kind of, kind of funny with the way the whole thing worked out, which is that uh, for several years, my fellow advocates have, have really been pushing hard 
for for some types of uh, of, of a self cleaning toilets. I forget what they're called to to, uh, to actually be put around town for the homeless, and that that effort's at least five years old. Uh, and then it, it took a pandemic, uh, and, and because of the pandemic, uh, a lot of places are closed. A lot of businesses, a lot of restaurants are closed that the homeless would normally go to. And, and so it was actually D.C. government and the federal government that came together to uh, get these porta potties. Uh, so some are being paid for by HCMA, Homeland Security Emer- Emergency Management Agency. Some are being paid for by D.C. government to contract and procurement. So, so there are actually two separate efforts. You know, my, my fellow advocates pushing for these toilets and, the, and then D.C. government deciding that because of the pandemic and uh, many places being closed, that they had to provide these for the homeless. And so, and so it was just coincidence that, that they decided to do what we've been asking for for so many years. But unfortunately, uh, their, their end date is around September 30th. Uh, and, and for the port for the porta potties, and so as of September 30th, they're going to take them away, and, and uh, we're going to be back to square one. And I don't know if the businesses where the homeless used to go to use the facilities are going to reallow the homeless in there. Uh, that that has yet to be seen. So so uh, my my argument and the argument that others are beginning to make now is to keep these porta potties in place. Until people get housed, that would be more of an incentive. I'm so sorry, that didn't work. Oh, sorry. Uh, what didn't work? My sound? Oh, no, go ahead. I'm uh, sorry. Go ahead, Eric. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so, so anyway, uh, if the city commits to uh, keeping the porta potties in place until they get people at the encampments housed, that would be more of an incentive to rush the uh, housing process, and hopefully it doesn't get rushed titulous haphazard i've seen that too but but uh it, it'd be more of an incentive to get people into housing because dc uh is really slow going in terms of the housing process they, they do they've been focusing on the uh most vulnerable since 2008 when they first developed psa cheering in dc uh they, they haven't really shifted away from that and and uh, they, they've done very little. They, they have done a little, but very little for the working homeless. Uh, and, and so it, this might be the moment where, where we need to kind of uh, move fully into doing something around the working homeless and making sure that uh, everything lines up. You know I mean, because like I say, you know, on my job, you know, at minimum wage, you make $30,000 uh, a year in D.C., and, and yet, you know, you make too much at that point to, to qualify for this housing program, but you still need housing assistance because if you make if you make thirty thousand dollars a year, then then uh, that's twenty five hundred a month. You can pay eight hundred eight hundred a month in rent, but DC rents average between two thousand and twenty five hundred. So so uh, the things aren't can really you, lining Eric, up. Can, Eric, this is Lisa again. Can you talk a little bit more about how? connected with using FEMA and Homeland Security as a resource. I think for people on the, the call, um, and we've got homeless providers from all over the country, not just from the D.C. area. Uh, so if you could just talk sort of uh, for a few minutes uh, kind of high level about some strategies that people could use to engage their local FEMA or Homeland Security contacts uh, to make those connections uh, that you did to maybe procure uh, resources for people. Uh, so, so uh, I I actually work for the porta potty company. So, so I personally didn't uh, make the call to to get those porta potties uh, put out there. Uh, I'm not sure exactly who it was in DC government that decided to get them. Uh, I, I guess someone realized it was a health issue. Uh, so. With me having not actually been in that conversation, you know, I'm, I'm the guy on the receiving end who, who received the order to put these out there. Uh, and, and so I, I guess, you know, if you, if you can make the argument that, that it is a public health issue, uh, and, and like I said, a friend of mine in Philadelphia said that they had this hep C outbreak because of people using the alleys. Uh, right. And, and so, so that, that, that's probably the best place to start. Uh, I should also say that in D.C., we, we have a very robust uh, a- 
advocacy community. Uh, going back to the 80s, the, the homeless advocates went up against Reagan when he was president to, to really get him to pay attention to homelessness. You know, and, and that culture has remained for about 35 or so years now. Uh, and, and so we, we have lawyers that are there just for the homeless. And we have a, a, a very big network of, of uh, nonprofits that work for the homeless. So I, I'm not sure which one of them actually brought that argument to D.C. government, but D.C. government was very receptive. Uh, and, and so in, in other parts of the country, I, I would just say that you, you probably have to be able to make the strong case that it's a public health issue, you know, and and, uh, yeah. and show basically that, that people don't have nowhere to go to use the restroom while these places were all closed up. You know, right. and if, if that doesn't, I don't know what else to tell you. If, if, if they're beyond reasoning, I don't know what to tell you. Right. No, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And we're gonna um, we're gonna pivot right now back to to Shara. Uh, so if you have any questions for Eric um, to kind of get more feedback from him about making sure that we're including the needs of all people who are experiencing homelessness. Eric brought up a really good point. We can't lose sight of it, that there are people who are working and they need access to services. And what does that mean for our program and our system delivery? So thank you so much, Eric, for that. Um, so I'm asking folks if uh, just to put a pin in your questions and then I'm gonna turn it back over to Shara and Bridget uh, to keep the conversation moving. So, so thank you, thank you, Eric. Okay. Okay, I believe that Sean is now um, on audio. Are you there, Sean? Sorry, we seem to have lost him again. Please go to another speaker. I'll get back to him. No worries. Um, thank you all for your patience. I've been on a couple of WebEx things today and it's it's just not going well. The sound is, is not working, some of the videos. So I know that we are all living in a virtual world now. So thank you for just bearing with us. Um, I If we can move the slides then, I think um, we can go on to um, Ashwara. And please, I apologize if I pronounced your name wrong. Please correct me if I did. You said it, you said it fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Aishwarya Raja, and I'm a fourth year medical student at Mount Sinai and the founder and director of Mass Transit. Today, I just wanted to talk to you all about just why we decided to found Mass Transit, the need in our community, what we've done in East Harlem, and how we've expanded now to the DC, Virginia area. Next slide. So to provide you with uh, some background, the COVID-19 pandemic has been touted by some as a great equalizer, but it's brought to the forefront long-standing disparities in access to healthcare for Black, Latinx, immigrant, and low-income communities. We've seen that studies have shown that some individuals are bearing the burden of COVID-19 more so than others. Um, a study recently came out showing that Black Americans are especially affected, um, with them being represented twice as often among COVID-19 deaths as they are in the population. Um, and within New York City, there are headlines that have come out by like CNN, New York Times, showing that neighborhoods um, that are predominantly Black or Latinx are experiencing higher rates and deaths related to COVID-19 versus wider or wealthier neighborhoods. And an article um, in the New York Times showed that um, there was a mass exodus of individuals from wealthier and more affluent neighborhoods in New York City, while more vulnerable neighborhoods were basically um, still remaining in New York City um, and kind of suffering the financial, mental, and literal suffocation by the virus. Next slide, please. So in terms of um, why we felt like we were needed, so in April 2020, the Centers for Disease Control came out with guidelines saying that everyone should be wearing a cloth mask when out in public and especially at-risk populations to prevent the spread of COVID-19. But due to lack of resources and lack of funding, certain community groups were being uh, overlooked. And so this further widened disparities. So we came together as a medical school and we founded Mass Transit, which 
aims to distribute masks and educational materials on proper mask use and COVID-19 precautions to vulnerable communities, including essential workers and individuals experiencing homelessness. Next slide, slide please. So our first um, chapter was in East Harlem because Mount Sinai is located at the intersection between the Upper East Side, which is one of the wealthiest zip codes in the United States, and um, East Harlem, which is one of the poorest. Next slide. Next. Um, so among the hardest in Manhattan and New York City is East Harlem, which is a neighborhood consisting of around 130,000 individuals, of which 26% are Black and 52% are Latinx. And as you can see in these maps, um, there are higher than average percentages of um, service workers, uh, people of color, and um, rent burden households. And it almost eerily seems to coincide with higher than average number of cases of COVID-19 with numbers like one in 40 cases per capita and deaths between one in 300 and one in 400 per capita. Next slide, please. And so our pilot partners included Mount Sinai Hospital, which was integral in basically rerouting cloth mask donations that they were not accepting over to us to distribute to the community, as well as the East Harlem Health Outreach Partnership, or EHOP, which is our school student-run free clinic, which sees approximately 300 uninsured, low-income individuals in East Harlem. And so by working together, we were able to create educational material with faculty support, um, including Dr. Yasmin Mia, who is the director of EHOP, as well as Dr. Andrew Coyle, who works with a lot of individuals who suffer from homelessness, um, as well as with student volunteers who help distribute the masks and educational materials. Next slide, please. And so our initial draft of the educational material was targeted for the EHOP community. So it included information on why to wear a mask, how to use a mask, how to clean the mask, compiled from CDC and the World Health Organization guidelines. We also provided clinic specific resources for patients to turn to. And on the other side of the document included instructions on how to make a mask themselves at home, um, based again on these guidelines that have been published. And we had translations available in Spanish and English. Next slide. But then for the general community, we knew we had to reformat it to a more accessible, less resource intensive format. So we essentially sh um, shrunk down this eight and a half by 11 sheet to quarter cards, which are easier to print um, and less resource intensive. Next slide. And so as you can see in our documents, we wanted to make sure our language was accessible. So we wrote it at a fifth grade reading level. We distilled the content down to the most important facts, including reasons why you should wear a mask, which is to essentially protect your community. And that's what we really wanted to emphasize. It's to protect people around you who are more at risk. Um, it, again, less resource intensive, as I mentioned, and available in five languages, again, to accommodate the diverse population in New York City. Next slide. And so we created two versions, one of them for the more general population and one for the undomiciled population. And this includes information that is more specific to those living in shelters or those living outdoors, and includes information like if you're feeling sick, alert your case manager or shelter staff. And these guidelines, although they're not universal in the sense that avoiding public transportation may not be um, something that every single person who is homeless can do, they were guidelines that were compiled by the CDC through conversations with shelter staff and um, just the populations that they work with. And so it's not... Um, it's not universal, but we again tried to compile the information that was available online and created versions for both cloth and disposable masks because, again, cloth masks are not necessarily something that individuals who are homeless can maintain and clean. And so we wanted to make sure we had a disposable version available as well. Next slide. And so our mask donation streams, as I mentioned, included hospitals that were not accepting cloth masks local mask makers and just outfits of individuals who are making masks in the community, which we found through Facebook and other social media. And finally, very generous small businesses, including fabric and clothing companies. Next slide. And so within East Harlem, um, in two months since our founding, we were able to distribute over um, 7,000 mask kits to 12 community-based organization partners. Next slide. And the lessons that we learned here, which I do think is applicable to 
um, more chapters and more um, branches that we started mass transit is we were able to assess the needs of the communities who were living in East Harlem by working with East Harlem based committees and subcommittees, including the East Harlem Community Health Committee and the East Harlem COAD or Communities Organization Active in Disaster. And so they provided us with a list of the active needs in the community. Then we leveraged community-based infrastructure and tapped into existing networks. And this involved distributing the masks as well as printing educational materials. So to provide an example of this, we worked with New York Common Pantry and they essentially printed out our educational materials, handed them to individuals in line while they were waiting for food. So they had a chance to read the materials before they provided them with the mask and the food. And so it worked within their infrastructure and we wanted to really make sure it was easy and accessible. Next slide. And so now we have expanded nationally. Um, next slide. And we have distributed 20,000 mask kits uh, through 10 chapters to 40 plus community-based organization partners, including free clinics, food pantries, shelters, and public housing authorities with an additional 40,000 masks pledged to mass transit affiliates by the end of June. Next slide. And so our organization partners range from East Coast um, states all the way to California. And as I mentioned, we partnered with student-run free clinics, which are affiliated with medical schools. And that was an easy way for us to start chapters in different states um, using our medical school network system. Next slide. And specific to this talk, um, our impact in the DC Virginia area has been more recent. Um, it's been two weeks since we've established mass transit here. And our first kit was delivered to the DC Coalition for the Homeless on May 21st. Um, and we've partnered with a few other organizations since then in Virginia, um, the Fairfax County Department of Health and the Streetlight Ministry, which operates in Woodbridge. And we've distributed around a, mat, a thousand mass kits through these community partners. And we've recently um, got George Washington Medical students involved who we hopefully um, can enlist to carry on mass transit once I leave or um, our affiliate um, leaves as well. Next slide. And so in terms of what um, is important moving forward, especially in this chapter, is we want to continue serving needs for mass among community organizations in DC and Virginia in anticipation of a second wave in the fall and winter. Things are getting quieter now, but um, studies are showing that there may be a resurgence of cases in the fall and winter. So if your organization is in need of masks or anticipate being in need of masks, you can definitely contact us at masstransit at gmail.com. And we're also rerouting donation streams to this area. So again, you can contact us if you have any leads in terms of mask donations, fabric donations, or other supplies. And we also have a GoFundMe, which I have listed here. And next slide. So I wanted to thank you all for allowing us to present today. And we have a lot of social media pages as well as a website. So please do check us out and reach out if you have any questions or concerns. Thank you for that information today, Ashla. We really do appreciate it. Next, we will have Sean Jones of the Baltimore Life Experience Advisory Committee. And I just want to say welcome, Sean, to today's session. Sean, are you there? I am here. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you for allowing me to attend today's <coughs> excuse me, webinar, and uh, happy to be here today. So my name is Sean Jones. I am the chair of the Lived Experience Advisory Committee of the Baltimore City COC uh, here in Baltimore City. I'm also a co-chair of many other committees, not only at the local level uh, through the COC, but also at the state level with the Maryland Interagency Council on Homelessness, as well as the federal level of the U.S. Interagency Council. I'm going to uh, move forward to the slide that states five key strategies, but before I state that, I'd like to just kind of preempt that conversation with, with just this. We all know this, but, but I think we have to remind ourselves one simple thing, and that housing is a human right, and every person, every human being deserves a safe place to call home, right? So, you know, we feel in Baltimore that through various activities and strategies and systematic approaches that we 
have a comprehensive comprehensive system to hopefully moving forward to prevent and ultimately end homelessness, the overall experience of it, using evidence-based practices and strategies that we're finding from other communities, as well as uh, real-time experiences here in, in Baltimore City, uh, also based on previous efforts that we made. So moving forward, ultimately, our goal is to hope that all homeless citizens can have a safe place to call home and ultimately the support that they need to reach their full potential. That's really our underlying goal. And obviously, as some of my other fellow presenters have stated, it's really important to understand and realize that even though COVID has been a very traumatizing experience for many people throughout our world and lives have been lost, um, the irony of it, I guess, is that we are now having many, many doors open that, that weren't open before. A lot of funding that's uh, accessible and, and being uh, utilized in, in unique ways. Uh, so for me, I think that now is the time to truly put our bootstraps on and have the attitude that we're going to truly end homelessness or ultimately make it rare and brief. And in the meantime, you know, do whatever we need to locally, nationally, regionally to rehouse people, uh, not just in a temporary scenario, but long-term and permanent. So that being said, I'd like to focus then on briefly Baltimore City's action plan on homelessness as a whole. We have five key strategies that we've been utilizing even through the COVID uh, timeframe. Uh, ultimately, the first one is to increase the supply of affordable housing. And what does that mean? I mean, obviously we know what that means, but I wanna kind of break that down a little bit further. We're currently going, going through an analysis process of, of the cur current housing inventory not only what we need, but what we have in place, whether it be an abandoned minimum, as people call them, abandoned houses and what have you, or whether it be uh, something that can be converted uh, that's already in place, uh, whether it be a, a new development that's being put together, development project and making sure that we partner with these developers to assure that there's affordable housing, uh, free and or affordable housing put in place. Uh, hopefully with a newly designed AMI structure, as one of my, again, presenting uh, colleagues mentioned before, the AMI uh, number is just uh, sometimes too much for people to afford 30% of their average mean income. Uh, we're launching a local voucher program to supplement the vouchers that Section 8 has from a federal level, uh, ultimately increasing investments in rapid rehousing. And uh, the last two primary focuses in order for us to increase the supply of affordable housing is to support and promote policies that prevent and end homelessness. And I just want to say that as a caveat, one of those ways that we support and promote policies is not just at a local level, but really working with partners such as HUD, SNAP's office to say, hey, you know, we don't want to move backward. Let's go forward in this. Uh, here we are. People have been transitioned to schools, transitioned to hotels or whatever. Uh, to help with social distancing, et cetera, to keep people safe. But, you know, they're all, in, generally speaking, in individual, individualized rooms now. They're living uh, a different life than they were before. They're being refueled and recharged and uh, revitalized, so to speak. Let's not go backwards and have them go back into a traditional shelter format. Uh, and then lastly, expanding the Medicaid uh, pilot that we have locally here, uh, which is going really well. It ultimately was a wraparound service type program utilizing Medicaid dollars to support the, the uh, wraparound services and also a strategic alliance between the various hospitals, hospital and health systems in the area in conjunction with some housing in, as a whole. So essentially permanent support of housing, but with a, with a twist. Uh, the next uh, area of focus in our key strategies as it relates to our action plan on homelessness is to create a more effective homeless response system. Well, what does that mean again? Well, ultimately, you know, we all know in different markets and different cities and different metropolitan areas throughout the country, there are systems that are currently in place that have, uh, have been broken or they are broken. They just don't work. You know, the definition of insanity is that constantly trying the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Well, our attitude is we're not going to do that anymore. We have 40, 50, maybe 100 years worth of experience of, of dealing with a broken system or hiccups along the way. Not, no disrespect to the uh, strategic partners and the providers that we have here in Baltimore City and the surrounding counties, but the bottom line is it, it hasn't worked thus far. So, you know, we really want to enhance our coordinated access system, streamline the process using uh, technology to help do that, to really shorten that window of time it takes to get people housed ultimately from actual initial intake uh, to actual getting their various 
documents that they need to qualify for housing and then ultimately getting matched in, into housing. Also, we really want to take more of a serious effort. There's been a few pockets of these programs here and there, uh, prevention and diversion programs, but we really want to implement a more robust uh, program as it relates to that. Uh, the last two sub uh, strategies within that component is implement a system-wide outreach strategy, and then lastly, implementing standards of care and training plan. Our next uh, focus area or strategy is to transform the shelter system. Again, we don't want to move backwards. You know, we are going to have two or three of the shelters that were closed uh, reopen probably in the near future, hopefully post-COVID. However, we don't want to go back to the old uh, the old way of doing things where, you know, we surpassed the whole 90-day plan of people being in a temporary uh, housing center situation in the shelter due to an emergency, whether it be domestic violence related or runaway youth or whatever the reason why the person's homeless, we don't want to get in a habit where it's, you know, 90 days and another 90 days and now it's a year or two years, three years, four years, five years. We don't want to get in that habit any longer. We want to get in a point where a shelter is truly just a, a an emergency scenario that's a short-term stay until they can get their feet back on the ground through our help and support and into a permanent solution for housing. Next is, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm losing my voice, you all. During the transformation process, you know, not only are we working hard to improve the physical conditions of the shelter, uh, but also to improve uh, logistics, uh, transportation services, the food, you know, just the overall service delivery component. And that means that we have to really engage our strategic partners even more for a comprehensive plan to do that. And also even working with the area hospitals and medical teams to make sure when people are discharged back into the street, so to speak, that they're not just dis discharged into homelessness after their medical situation, that they truly are taken care of, uh, whether they go through convalescent uh, care scenario or not. And then lastly, ultimately, again, developing a citywide transportation initiative in partnership with the MTA, the Maryland Trans Transit Authority here, uh, in conjunction with any other transportation providers we have on a private level. The last two key strategies, uh, the first one being improving our access to employment and economic opportunities. And I'm speaking, obviously, to our homeless citizens. Many individuals that are homeless either have a background in working, uh, have a, you know their success story, they've been on the mountaintop before, but for whatever reason, they may not be working now, whether it be a health-related scenario, whether they were laid off, maybe it was a COVID scenario, who knows what that reason is. Maybe there was some downsizing, right-sizing. There's all kinds of reasons people lose their jobs or, or aren't working. At the end of the day, uh, we really want to integrate employment and income resources through a two-pronged process system-wide to help refer people back into work or job training or, or school or what have you to help them get their, you know, their, a leg up and back on their feet. We also want to create integrated learning communities, you know, partnering with area universities, colleges, certification programs, and such to help people, again, access what they might not normally be able to access. And then lastly, reforming policies and practices to support economic opportunity. Those, those policies could be related to something as minimal of, of looking, taking a hard look at the, um, the criminal justice system and saying, okay, if this particular person was an offender of X, Y, and Z, is that really something that holds up their, their opportunity to work? Even though Maryland has passed a law where, where uh, background checks and things of that nature and criminal background, there's a lot of hoops that employers have to go through to even access that data. But at the same time, uh, well, you know, what if there's something on their record from seven, eight, ten years ago, or even five years ago that really is a mute point at this point? You know, how can we help them remove and not only remove some of that information on there by partnering with agencies like the HPRP here, Homeless Persons Representation Project, legal firm, uh, or whether it be, you know, working with the judges or what have you. Just really bottom line is not only changing policies and procedures and, and policies and practices, but at the same time helping, you know, with the expungement process or whatever it takes to get people, um, I'll, I'll say, more qualified to a potential employer or less, or less of a restriction. And then lastly, I know we've all, all of the communities have talked a lot about race equity, but we really want to 
establish and continue establishing uh, and expanding on our race equity agenda. You know, we want to revise our data collection strategies. We want to provide training and technical assistance, which we've been doing ongoing over the last year or so here in Baltimore City and in the surrounding areas. And we also want to reform practices and policies to address and rectify racial disparities. And the last thing I'll say uh, as, we, as I wrap up here is, again, our attitude here in Maryland is leveraging the COVID-19 scenario uh, to really take this time to not only regroup, strategize, brainstorm, and uh, house people, but to really change the way we, we move forward, change our behavior, not only as, as advocates, but also as uh, partners here with the homeless community, as well as the city and the state and the uh, various providers. And that's all I have for you today. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Sean, for that information. I find the five strategies in which you have outlined today's presentation was very helpful, and I would hope that others, the COCs as well, would take this information and apply it into and apply it in terms of the homelessness and then connect with the lived experience. Next, we're going to have Chase Evans from the um, Intentional Homeless Association. And Chase, are you available? Yes, ma'am. How are you today? Great. Wonderful. Um, so we're just going to get started, and thank you again for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Um, so I'm a little bit nervous. I've never done this before, but uh, That's okay. yeah, I, I kind of have a lot to go over. This is this is a little exciting for me. Okay. Um, so it, it, was, it was really hard to kind of wrap my mind around this. All, everything you guys are talking about, especially at the system level, because a lot of this goes over our heads at, at, at um, for homeless people. Uh, but I, I guess I could ask myself the question, how, how has COVID-19 affected homelessness, which is really where I started with all of this. Um, and, and in a lot of my research, I, I kind of found myself in between all of the everything's going on. I mean, uh, the two extremes are New York and Los Angeles. Uh, New York is having a problem with having so many homeless people packed into, into buildings and not having the medical infrastructure to, to sustain them or, or to socially distance or whatever. And Los Angeles has so many people outside that they don't know how to keep the spread, keep it from contained as, as far as getting into the community. So being in Houston and, and seeing both of those scenarios play out, uh, it, it's kind of giving me an interesting perspective. And, and the more homeless people I talk to, the more, I hate to say it, but COVID-19 has, has helped homelessness. Um, I mean, not, not only because we get to have this, this hygiene conversation or the, the health conversation, um, but in in effect too i mean really what did what did COVID do it, it it occupied the police uh it slowed traffic which was good and bad um you know it made people distance themselves from each other and it halted business in for-profit and non-profit i mean a lot of a lot of shelters shut down a lot of um a lot of charities really didn't have the staff or couldn't couldn't do anything about the situation and were forced to close not close but pause everything and really the biggest problem was the confusion um right when this all started all the homeless people here uh, they just I don't, who knows where they went they, they disappeared from each other they couldn't find each other and and you start to see as time went on as things didn't explode they started to come out of the woodwork and the people that were out in the roads, like the vehicle traffic for the panhandlers and whatnot, those were the people that were out helping the community and realizing that there's such a need that homeless people actually reported a huge uptick in, in handouts and in assistance. So yeah, there might not have been very many cars out, but it was, they were telling me it was almost every car was giving them five, ten, twenty dollars. Um, and, and there were, the, the organizations in my area realized that there was a huge need for, for, for food and whatnot. And, and it just, it seemed to, it seemed like it shut everything down, like nothing, like none of this was going to get, uh, none, none of this was going to happen. But 
it, it really it really ramped it up. It, it was it was really weird to see, and I I can't say that for sure in in a lot of other cities because I only get the and a lot. So this might just be a Houston thing, but but um but it really it really helped a lot. I mean there was and then and then once the 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 stimulus hit, I mean it was it was almost like the the homeless people were sitting pretty in the street. Um, but that didn't that didn't mitigate the health issue. And uh, I, from from what Eric was saying earlier, uh, I have to ask myself the question: Why doesn't the DC community want the porta potties removed? And it's it's because it was the porta potties were mitigating a health issue. I mean, he, he said that they were getting hep, hep A or whatever it was in the in, in the alleys from, from going to the bathroom in the alleys, and and then that's that's really the importance of of what I want to get across is we've been at the bottom, we're at the bottom. These people didn't experience anything worse uh, when the pandemic happened. It was it's the same as any other day. Um, so to build on that, the the health issue is is still the issue. It's it's a health and hygiene crisis. And you know, asking yourself how has COVID affected homelessness, it, it's really an arbitrary question because the question itself doesn't have the aim to to give us what we need, the information we need to solve the problem. Because um, we can't fix this with Band-Aids and, and we can't fix this with legislation unless that legislation reflect, reflects the problem that was already there that, and that's the health and, and hygiene problem. Um, so let me, I'm looking at my notes here, I'm sorry, give me a second. Um, no, no, yeah. uh, Chase, this is Lisa. No, that was so helpful. In the interest of time, I'm, I'm going to actually just see if we can open it up for a couple of questions to you and Sean uh, and okay. Eric and, and Ashwarya. Um, so that was really helpful just to have that perspective to remind us all of, right, the very important public health needs that people experienced before the pandemic. And I appreciated uh, all of our speakers who talked about using this as an opportunity to leverage, right, what we need to have in place in order to prevent and end homelessness for people. So, no, I thank you, Chef, or thank you so much, Chase. I appreciate that framing. Uh, we, I think we have a few minutes. We're slated to go to four. Uh, so you'll see on the screen that there are some resources that you can reach out to if you want more information for, from Mass Transit or if you want to reach out to Sean. Um, and I, we have Eric's email. I won't send that out publicly, uh, but if, if you are wanting to get in, in touch with Eric, please email us here in the SNAPS office. You can do that at snapsinfo at hud.gov. Uh, it will connect you uh, to Eric. But, but one question, though, I, we, we did want to ask uh, while we still have a few minutes is, Eric, if we've had some questions in the chat. Folks want to kind of hear who are the folks that you went to in the city when you made that first ask about procuring porta potties and, and, and hygiene resources for people. Folks are just trying to figure out who, you know, what what department did you go to? Did you go to the Department of Health or did you go to the homeless liaison? So if you could just talk for a minute um, to give people some suggestions about who they should reach out in their localities. Uh, so what, what, what I was saying was that I, I actually work for the porta potty company, and I, I so so uh, I didn't go to DC government. They 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 came to our company. So 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 that that's that's what I'm saying is that is that uh, I don't know who who contacted them or or what, what, what decision began, but what, when that decision was made. I, 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 Okay, but when, when that decision was made, they called our company. Yeah, so, 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 uh, what, what I did know is this, though, is that there, there is a nonprofit, the, the Washington Legal Clinic for the Homeless. They've been around since the 80s, and they've been advocating for the homeless on, on many fronts. Uh, I, I, I would suspect that, that 
that they might have gone to DC government, so I may I may have to call them and and, and get back with you with with that answer. But I, but I I don't really know who who contacted the government. The, the government contacted me. Okay. No, thank you for that. And someone Karen just posted in the chat that uh, their homeless task force was able to procure a trailer with mobile showers. Um, so Karen, if you wouldn't mind. I'm going to ask if you could share your email in the chat. So if there are folks who kind of want to hear more from you about how you did that, uh, that would be helpful. And Eric, one more thing. So, do you, and you may not know this. Do you know, we got a question in the chat. Do you know which department from DC government contacted your company? And if you so don't. We were contacted by HCMA which is Homeland Security Emergency Management Agency, okay. and, uh, and, and also by D.C. government's uh, Department of Contract and, Pro and Procurement. So because okay. well, all my, I, I have the paperwork, and, it, and that, that's whose name is on it. Okay, I appreciate that. So, uh, Kay Nicole, I hope you heard that. Maybe that's a suggestion for you if you want to maybe start with the folks in your community that are doing the emergency management provisions. That might be a department that you might want to reach out to, or even your your county health department. They might be an advocate to help you um, with porta potties. And see some of the um, other. There was also okay. a couple questions. Sorry, Lisa, in the chat for Sean. Um, regarding the racial disparity, and I know that we have one minute, so um, Sean, I know that, I don't know how you're actually connected to us, but if you can share your contact information for people to follow up, or if you don't mind, if we put um, your slide up, I think has several uh, ways to contact you, um, just so I know, I'm sorry that we're out of time, but I wanna make sure everyone's questions are answered. Yeah, you can put my information up, and I'll I'll put my uh, information out right now on the chat. Thank you. Hello, you're welcome. Um, thank, yeah, thank you guys for all joining us. Um, I think someone is asking also, Chase, can you put your contact if you're comfortable? If not, um, I will put my email in the chat. Um, if you guys have follow-up questions, um, you can always reach out to myself. I think Lisa's contact is also um, further up in the chat. Um, and hopefully we'll continue to have uh, more conversations like this. Um, I know that we would love to. Great, okay, have a great day everyone. Take care. Take care. Thank you.